Okay, hi, how you doing all? So welcome to uh, another episode of Learning to Look. Uh, we are looking right now at, a, we're in the midst of looking at prehistoric art, which had to be broken into two. And the more I learned, I could have done three, but we'll be moving on. I want to give you some dates that are coming up. On Saturday the 6th, we'll be having Coffee with the Curator. Uh, that's for our current show that's up at the gallery, Generations of Color. Most of the artists will join us. And if you're one of the first 25 people to register at Pat Med Library, you can get yourself a a souvenir coffee cup with some of the artwork on it. And it comes Was I muted? Was I, muted? <laughs> I was muted that whole time. Huh? Okay. It's asking me, we're, we're having a little bit of tef technical difficulties here. It should be okay now, but I need uh, Roberta and Roseanne to please mute your microphone. And Crystal, well, please. Anybody who's not. <laughs> Anybody who's not. <laughs> It'll uh, reduce the feedback for John. Okay, give me one sec, John. I'm sorry. Was I muted that whole time? No, you weren't muted that whole time. It was just the last, like, two minutes. You were just talking about the coffee mug and picking it up. So mm -hmm. Maybe just repeat that again for our guests. And you okay. I will do that. Okay. Okay, so, so yeah, so... Um, uh, if you register the, with the Pat Med Library for the Coffee with the Curator um, Febu for February 6th for our Generations of Color show, you can get a souvenir coffee cup with with prints of the some of the artwork on it, and it comes with some some uh, Pat Med special blend coffee that you could brew at home and, jo and join in on the fun. Anyway, Coffee with the Curator is February 6th. On February 18th, in honor of Black History Month, Learning to Look, this show will be doing um, a, a historic look at African-American artists. Let's see what's next. And then comes March. I have my little handy book here. And in March, we'll be opening up Sidling. That is going to be on the 13th. And uh, we'll be then having coffee with the curator on the 20th for Sidling. And um, learning to look again on March 25th. Let's see, what was the plan for that one? I'll let you know. And I think that's far enough into the future for now. Okay, so I'd like to remind everybody that um, if you have any questions during this session, you can put them in the chat room and somebody will read them to me. Okay, so we'll get going now. Um, as I said, uh, prehistoric art part two, the Neolithic. Okay, so prehistoric essentially means prior to history, right? And of course, to have history, you have to have, um, you have to have writing, right? So um, prehistoric art lasts until the historic period, and that would be wherever and whenever uh, writing was introduced in a, in, in a particular area. The earliest place for the beginning of history is the Near East, and it's circa 3000 BCE. Okay, a term that we often use is Stone Age, which, you know, it's almost synonymous with prehistoric, but it means something different. Stone Age refers to the industry of making tools out of stone, right? And so Stone Age lasts until we begin the Bronze Age. Now, in a lot of places, the Bronze Age and history are almost contemporary, but in other places, they could be very far off. 
uh, in China. Uh, uh, the use of bronze predates writing by almost a thousand years. And, um, and in other places, you know, um, uh, the, the metallurgy did not come until much later. In a place like um, the Mayans, they had a writing system, but they did not have a metallurgy. So um, again, another term that we think of is Paleolithic. Now, Paleolithic is the old Stone Age, and it really lasts a long time. In the last uh, session, I talked about how it stretches back tens or hundreds of thousands of years from the first use of stone tools. And the people who, who uh, the Paleolithic people were all hunter-gatherers. Now, if you have a Paleolithic, you would need, of course, to have the Neolithic, and that's the New Stone Age. And the thing that separates the Neolithic from the Paleolithic is the beginning of agriculture, right? Uh, the domestication of animals, uh, especially animals for food, um, and the beginning of settled villages. So the Neolithic period, um, nice, nice little uh, village, Neolithic, Neolithic village there. Um, the Neolithic period also had had uh, the last improvement in the making of stone tools. Right? And um, what happened was they would be ground to and and then polished so prior to then they were just chipped but uh somewhere around 10,000 BCE um, the technology was developed to make really sharp tools okay so the neolithic period comes you know from the paleolithic and it lasts until um like the bronze age i guess but um it the dates vary in different parts of the world so the reason why um uh, the neolithic began or how the neolithic began had to do with the receding of the last ice age as the as the ice moved north um it left uh, plains, um, flat plains, especially in in uh, the lower, closer to the um, the equator, and and um, uh, people who were living in those places, they were very fertile, and they kind of learned how to uh, um, like go to the same place to get the food regularly, and then they learned how to how to adjust the land a little bit so the food grew better, and eventually over time they created farms. But um, you'd have to be, you know, further south as the ice was ice was receding. So if you notice the the um, in northern Europe, um, the Neolithic doesn't begin for another four thousand years, right? and um, and it lasts later. You know, bronze is introduced, but you notice that the dates are closer together for the beginning of the Bronze Age, which would be the second number, because as time went on. Oh, I'm getting it. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I think Beth wants me. Pardon the interruption. Okay. Okay. You've got a lot of static, I hear. I don't know. I don't feel like there's anything coming from me unless, oh, I think I see what's happening. My um, cable is wrapped around and and it's now, um, it's frayed. Does that sound any better? Okay. I'll try to keep it from fraying. Okay. So anyway, um, from Africa to Europe to Asia, all those parts of the world were interconnected. So there was a, a general migration of ideas, usually from the Near East out. The Americas is a little bit of a different story. They developed, um, they, they developed these things without having, um, without having contact with the other, with the other places. So um, it, it developed later there. 
Um, one of the things that we notice in the Neolithic period is the development of megalithic structures. We're also going to look at temples and temple art and, uh, and some ceramic pieces today. Um, uh, but first, we're going to look at the megalithic structures. Right? And um, they're all over the world. But there seems to be an especially large concentration of them in 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 uh, Western France, uh, which is Brittany, England, and Ireland. So um, we'll be looking at a bunch from over there. Um, a single standing stone is often called a menhir, and a menhir is usually thought to be. Um, a, a land marker of some sort. It could be a barrier, a, you know, um, could be a, a point that needs to be reached along a trail, but um, it is just a singular stone that stands up. There are other kinds of stones that are, have um, different purposes. Um, dolmens, for instance, and you can see this one's as far away as South Korea. Uh, a dolmen is usually two stones that have a third stone on top of them, right? And uh, the structure could be, uh, you know, um, as at, in this case, it looks very rough or it could be a little bit more re uh, refined. But uh, the, f the function of a dolmen is to um, create a, a little interior space. And most of the time that interior space is used for, um, is used for burials. Now, other places stones are placed in alignment. Right? If you notice, these stones create a single line that goes for a really long time. This is from, from the British Islands. And um, um, there's a couple of ideas about what they may mean. And most people don't think of them as being bar uh, barriers or landscape boundaries at all. But um, I'm going to have to get tape on this. It's all frayed. But um, new theories have been speaking uh, about these pieces in a different way, these structures in a different way. Um, it has to do with the, the remembering. Right? Um, most of these pieces are created as a group of people move from the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer phase into a um, uh, Neolithic farming phase, so they are settling down. But there's this interesting concept that was first uh, discovered in Australia. And uh, we talk about the idea of song lines. And um, a Australian person could travel through the outback with uh, with this song that tells them about um, the locations and they could navigate places that they've never been because they have this song. Right? It, it's a way of creating, um, transmitting memories and holding on to important ideas. And what we start to see these things becoming is memory spaces, right? So, so um, if you were um, living in this time, you would associate each one of these stones with a, a particular piece of important information that your culture needs to maintain. And as you walk down through each one of these, you would be able to recite, you know, you know, the Constitution, or the, you know, or anything, you know, the Bill of Rights, or or how to hunt, or how to farm, or you know, all of that information would be encoded um, in your memory as you reach each particular stone. So um, there, there becomes an association with an object. Um, this used to be for the hunter gatherers the landscape, but now that people were staying in one spot, they were needing to make um, these uh, memory devices, you might say. So that's that's an interesting theory that I was just reading about um, that is relatively new.
And of course, the stone circles have the same purpose, right? A stone circle would be um, something that you could walk around and at each stone, at each station, you would remember something important, right? Um, uh, it's, it's interesting because if you're, if you're familiar with the Catholic uh, notion of the stations of the cross, Right? You find um, it's a similar thing. You go from one station to the next and you remember part of a story. And then there are hinges, right? Hinges are, um, are uh, mounds. They are often sur surrounded by moat-like structures and um, you know, they can be found in lots of places and we really don't have um, a clear idea of why the hinges was used. There's a lot of these, we end up thinking that there are multiple uses for. Okay, um, a, a cairn is a set of stacked stones. In this case, the stones have been covered with, with soil and, you know, uh, grass has grown over them. Right? But it's essentially a hollowed space, and a cairn uses um, not megalithic stones, usually smaller stones, and, and they're stacked up into maybe a corbelled, uh, um, a corbelled arch or dome. Right? And uh, a lot of cairns end up being what is called a passage tomb. There's usually a long, narrow um, entryway and then a, a space that's located behind behind the passage. One of the most famous uh, of the of these passage tombs is Newgrange, and Newgrange was um, excuse me, I have a, a a a box in my way. I can't I can't see. Okay, um, Newgrange is from thirty two. 100 BCE, and of course, um, if you were in the Near East, you would be entering, entering the the Bronze Age and the Historic Age. But in um, in the Northern Isles, you still had another thousand years to go before that time. So um, this is New Grange, and uh, just as um, uh, a note, the white facade that you see there was a reconstruction that was done ooh, in the last 70 or 80 years. So it, it doesn't really necessarily match the way it was supposed to be. Um, the, new, the, the opening to New Grange is famous for having this stone in, fr in front of it. Right? And they call these passage or entry stones, and most um, most of the uh, uh, passage tombs will have a marker in front of it. Right? It's not up against the wall. You can get behind it, and you can get in. Um, there are other stones that surround New Grange, and um, I didn't see them yet. So this is what's beyond the passage stone. I'm sorry, I think the last slide got lost. This is what's on the, uh, if you go past the passage stone, you'll notice you're inside the passage now. And you can see the light coming in, right, from the little window box above. Now that light will come in and it will pierce its way through all the way into the back, but it only does it for about five days. And of course, they would be straddling the um, the uh, solstice. And um, you would be able to, it would creep closer, closer in until the third day, and then it'd start to reach out again. But, you know, um, what, what, with that, we have something that uh, is another use of most of many of these uh, monumental pieces of uh, megalithic structures is that many of them have astronomical devices in them and they encode timing as well as memory. They were out of order. So this is the this is one of the other stones. It's called the curb stone. These are placed around New Grange, um, at you know almost like the, at the numbers on a, the dials of a clock, right? The numbers on the clock, and um, 
these are interesting in that um, they don't seem to be carved in place. They were all from a previous structure or they had previous uses and they were gathered up and they were used to create this circular passage around, around New Greenwich. Um, that's part of what we would consider the memory uh, aspect of it. So that idea of the light shining through is and hitting uh, a, a special spot um, is not just in Euro European culture, but it's a, it's around the entire world. And here is an example from Chaco Canyon in the United States. It's called the Sun Dagger because for only a few days does this little piece of light come through a crack in the cave and then you see the the uh, spiraling curve and it crosses it crosses that so um yeah we have this astronomical thing from the neolithic is is very important uh needing to know time uh for planting and you know preparation is an important part of an agricultural community. We're not going anywhere. We don't seem to be stuck on this slide. There we go. Okay. Well, you know, um, the most famous of all of the megalithic structures, of course, is Stonehenge. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, and of course, if you've ever uh, seen, you might even be able to see it on, on television these days. Um, they'll try to catch, I looked this year, but it was kind of a gray day and you couldn't see the sunrise through the, through the clouds. But um, people gather, you know, um, they, everyone of who goes to Stonehenge seems to have their own reason of why this is a sacred spot, but it did have lots of uses, right? So for many different reasons, Stonehenge uh, was important. It was built over the course of almost 1500 years. That doesn't mean that it was planned and then took 1500 years to execute. What it means is that it was rebuilt over and over again, you know, or added to or adjusted many times, right? So um, uh, that seems to be part of the idea that um, as people need to remember more things, you know, that the, the structure has to be changed to deal with the new memories. So the oldest part of Stonehenge is the henge. The henge is the part that is a raised earth structure, right? And um, you can see a very flat circle and then a, a rise, a berm that surrounds it, and then a moat on the outside after the berm, right? That was created 3,000, 5,000 years ago, actually, 3,000 BCE. And um, in normal um, definition, a henge would have a reverse. The pit would be on the inside and the berm would be on the outside. But uh, I guess they had their own reasons for doing that. So Beth tells me that this is Stonehenge Lane that we could see in this picture over here. And I guess, you know, um, uh, some people thought it, thought it wasn't that important. So they put roads right up close to it and whatnot. But um, uh, Stonehenge has meant has many things, been many things. So the, the, there is a ring of stones, the major uh, circular part of it, and it's 108 feet from one side to the other. The stones are 13 feet tall and seven feet wide. They weigh 25 tons, these stones, and um, they uh, actually have been slightly carved so there's fittings in them and that's why so many of them have been able to to stay if you you can look all the way out and see this stone over here this is one that's used for uh, uh, for um, 
and sightings. And within that circle are the biggest stones, the central trilithons. Right? And these are even twice as big as the others, you know. Um, they form a horseshoe of 45 feet, almost like a little alcove. Um, and they are between 20 and 24 feet tall and weigh up to 50 tons. These stones um, were brought 15 miles from where they were quarried. Right? And think about that, 50 tons of material uh, in, a, in a Neolithic culture is quite an, quite an achievement. Now, something that we, some things that we do know about, um, about Stonehenge is that, um, that they, you know, the burial aspect of it was very minimal. You know, um, they really don't, didn't think that was a primary function uh, of this structure. Um, they don't, um, you know, you know, they, you know, it has the, 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 the astronomical connections to it, uh, but it's also functions as one of those mnemonic devices as well. Uh, there's a circle of stones around it and this, all these different views that are created. Um, so each one of each, each station then would be, uh, offering uh, specific information to be remembered. Um, when these were created, there's been, there's, they are not really near anybody's village. You know, they're away from where the settlements were. And so um, it was definitely a place to go. It could have been a festival-like occur occurrence to go to Stonehenge, just like it is now. People would gather there for the solstice. Um, and its making was, um, there's been no evidence of coercion. Um, uh, there's, there's no evidence of a hierarchical uh, society in which there are people who have more power than others. Most everybody that they find in burials from this time is, uh, is uh, fairly equal. They don't see any power symbols buried with anybody. So at this point in the Neolithic period, uh, it was a consensual uh, a structure and the work was consensual and you know it took a lot of people working together in a concerted way um, you know there might have been some foremans but uh, or four women's but um, there was there was no coercion and it seemed to be something that the community all felt was necessary in its creation right so so the circular parts uh, the, the circular inner stones were put up over hundreds of years after the original berm. You can see that there's a number of different um, uh, astronomic settings in here for the, for the moon, the sun, solstice, right? And um, uh, it was, you know, it had to be laid out and planned for all of these things. And there were some adjustments that got made over time. So, um, that was uh, important. Uh, there, there are, are these holes on the outer rim, right? And it, they're thought to have been holding standing stones or wood wood timbers at the original time, right? So uh, there's no longer there now. So this is Stonehenge. Um, it is, you know, probably, you know, in Northern Europe, it is, is, it is the most famous and, and, and ambitious of all um, stone megaliths. And it was created, you know, between 3000 and 1500 BCE. But um, there are structures that are much older, which we are going to look at now. So, um, this is an interesting one because, well, personally for me, it's interesting because my son told me about it a few years ago. I didn't even know anything about it because it has just been recently excavated. And, and, and the excavation is ongoing now in Gobekli Tepe. Right? And um, this structure, which is a series of circular um, uh, areas with 
pillars inside them. And we'll look at some close-ups of the pillars in a couple of minutes, but um, they're spread out over over a uh, over a landscape, and um, what's very interesting about them is the centers of each of these are equidistant apart. So they were they were they were very um, accurately planned and placed, and they were done prior to the Neolithic period, right? Um, normally we think that it required the, the settled people concept to create the structures, but this structure predates the first settlements, right? Um, it's in, it's maybe 500 to 1000 years before the introduction introduction of agriculture. So this very first structure, um, confounds all of the theories that we've had up to this point. Um, here's a view of one of one of the spaces within it. And uh, these pillars are pretty tall there, you know, some of them are upwards of 14 feet tall. And they have, uh, in some cases, there's stone stacked upon, you know, a, a cross piece, as you can see, over some of them. And um, there's carving on, on them as well. So these carvings go back, oh, 11,000 years. And if you notice, they're, they're, they're pretty realistic, you know? So um, the idea of realistic carving goes way back and especially uh, involved with architecture. Well, some of the uh, sculpture that we have there. And um, some of there are there were some freestanding pieces found there as well as the warthog on the right. So the this is um, this, uh, this place. Again, we don't really know why it was made. It was made by a group of people who were still hunter gatherers, which meant that they were migratory. And uh, they were probably coming together at a time to unite as a larger group. You know, the bands would be small for for purposes of, of um, hunting and gathering, but they would come together into larger bands. And again, the people needed to remember a lot of things, you know, um, their whole cultural um, structure needed to be remembered. And it's believed that these structures, again, were part of a memory device for, um, for the hunter gatherers. So eventually the hunter gatherers uh, settled down and one of the oldest structures um, of a settlement is the tower is the wall and towers of Jericho. Um, this is in Palestine and it's um, about you know maybe 500 to a thousand years after Gobekli and um, it is a true settlement. A couple of millennia later, we find um, a, a large system of buildings called Katal Hayak, right? And this is also in Turkey, like a Gobekli, right? And um, Katal Hayak, uh, this is an excavation. Uh, I Oh, what I wanted to say about the other one first was that um, there was, it was kind of, um, no one noticed it was there for thousands of years and it was covered with dirt. And uh, one day the excavate, the future excavator was looking and he saw like this, this, like you could almost see towards the, towards the back of this one, a little rise. And um, it's like, you know, it seemed to be out of place um, for the geology. And so he went to it and he just kind of dug just a little bit and he found the beginning of a structure and that was in the 1990s and uh, excavation has been going on since then. Kettle Hayek has been excavated for a much longer period of time. And this is what, what a contemporary excavation looks like. It's, you know, they got a structure over it to protect it from the rain and, and the sun. And they, they dig away uh, carefully 
by removing dirt where it doesn't belong to reveal the structure. This is an or this is kind of what um, they thought that Catalhayoc looked like. It was a whole settlement. It was, a, you know, they were kind of like the adobe houses um, and they were built on top of each other and you can see the ladders and, and you actually got around on the roofs from one to the other and then you would take a ladder down into it. Um, Again, this is this is probably one of the first um, really large scale uh, village structures. And it reminds us of a structure that is some 4,000 years later, uh, the palace at Knossos, right? And, and it's um, the way it's built all around each other. Uh, that I just saw today, I was kind of interested in seeing that comparison, how similar they look. But we're gonna come back to this in a couple of minutes for one other reference, right? And this is what Katel Hayuk look like to the people who lived there. Because this is an aerial view of the settlement that was painted on the wall. There's paint, there's numbers of different paintings on the walls in Cattle Hayuk. Um, there's scenes of hunting um, and animals, but there is also this one, which is a map of, of the city, if you will. You know, so that's a kind of an abstract way of thinking, certainly because they could have never seen it from this view. So we're looking down into one of the rooms uh, and uh, this is often called the shrine room. Uh, notice right now, this is at an early stage before it was reconstructed, but as it was found, you saw, the, you see the uh, cattle horns over there and, um, you know, going all the way back this far, we see, you know, a uh, mythology uh, built up around bison and cattle, right? And um, this is a reconstruction of what it's, they think it looked like in that shrine room, right? And as you notice, there's lots of these cattle heads that are, um, that are juxtaposed against images of paintings and such. Um, so I thought of this also at the Palace of Knossos, right? And again, some 4,000 years later, we have the bull and we have the bull jumpers and we can see how important the bull is um, in the mythology stretching back for thousands of years and uh, lasting right up to the present in, in the idea of the running of the bulls and the bullfights. So in, Cattle Hayek Shrine Room was this figure. This figure is discovered, and she's almost she's very queenly sitting on her throne, right? Um, or at least a raised chair, and she's flanked by lions or some kind of felines on either side of her, and um, it's believed that she was giving birth. Um, the head is a reconstruction, there's no detail in it, but the rest of the body is the original part of this figure that was found at um, Katel Hayek. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the the um, some of the thinking that goes on around the mythology of these temples. Um, but to do that, I wanted to first go to Malta. And of course, it's a few uh, millennia, millennia later, but you know, that, that's the idea of how ideas, um, the transmission slow, slowly of ideas across continents, right? And here we see a, a deconstructed uh, temple from Malta, right? Um, here, is, here is what the, um, a, an artist view of the uh, engraving of what it looked like when it was being excavated in 1848. But next to this building that we call the Giantess is another one just a few uh, hundred yards away, right? And this would be the entrance into that um, temple. 
Now, when you think about what this looks like, right? I'm going into a dark place that really feels cavernous, right? I'm going into a, a, a you know, essentially a human made cavern, right? Now, uh, this is the entry to the to the temple, right? And I want to show you what it looks like in, in floor plan, right? So this is what the plans for these look like. And if you look at the one, the central one, there's three of them creating a um, radiating out from a center courtyard. But the, the center one, if you look at it, you notice it has um, a rather elongated outer room and then in, uh, a second room that seems to be a little bit smaller and then it has um, almost like a, a alcove in the end but you would have to pass through the passage to get into there now the shapes of these buildings are uh, are are what is most interesting the floor plan of these buildings if you will because um, this temple reminds us of a figure we saw in the last session, the Venus of Willendorf, in that when we looked at the Venus of Willendorf, we saw that here is a figure that is um, exaggerated in the breasts and the hips, um, as these are the parts that are um, most important for childbearing and child rearing, right? So, um, so we have this kind of silhouette that that appears over and over again in uh, starting in prehistoric art, but carrying over into Neolithic art as well too. And we see that same uh, form in this piece of architecture. Now, this piece this would have been covered with timbers and earth on top of that, so um, it would have would feel like you're going into this darkness, right? So, um, if 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 you could use your imagination for just a second, and you see the figure to the left, and then you see where the entrance is to this. Um, temple, you see that you would be actually entering into a womb-like structure, right? Um, and that structure would also feel like it was in the earth, you know, it would be covered and it would be cavernous as if you were part of the earth. So um, we start to get this concept of connecting um, the the fecundity of a woman with the earth and this temple all together, right? So as you're going into this structure, you're reincorporating with the creative feminine, if you will, and right? you will perform some kind of um, ritual on the inside, and then it would be time to come out, right? And, you know, we still have that phrase, reborn, right? That's what happens after the ritual when you're leaving the body of the mother, right? So that this is a very uh, important concept. Remember that these people are egalitarian. They have no hierarchy, right? Um, you know, the specialists are minimal and, you know, if they are, res they are responsible, Respected, but they they oftentimes are farmers, and you know they have lots of wear lots of hats, and um, even as people became part of like a a more special group back then, they were not really considered um, above or below anybody else. So um, we have an egalitarian culture that has a sense of mother worship or creative mother goddess worship or earth worship, right? All of that stuff um, is is kind of important. Um, when we think about uh, the beginning of agriculture, right? Agriculture was first, um, you know, would have been something that was developed by women, right? Women would have had the the wherewithal to know where the plants grew because they were gathering, right? And um, uh, they would know to go to the same spot every year to get the food as it was coming ripe. And then they learned that if they adjust the space, it will be more productive. And they 
gradually improved on farming practices until they developed the concept of agriculture. So agriculture, which is really the essence of the Neolithic period, is, um, is you know, begins as a feminine activity, right? So um, uh, in the economy of the Neolithic period, we don't see women relying on 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 the males as um, as uh, uh, economic factors. You know, they you know they're not providing for the women. The women are equal in providing uh, as the men are. And then, of course, when we think up uh, up to the uh, to this temple in Malta, this is the figure that is found inside it. Right. So again, we have the idea of, of the 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 sacred feminine and and the uh, the uh, the creative force within it. A little bit later, uh, we start to see some uh, some works that are becoming more abstracted uh, uh, female figurines, and right? and that idea of abstraction is very important. And I'm going to be looking at it through the lens of ceramic. Right, um, Neolithic ceramics um, is is. Um, Really, it's interesting that, you know, we think of the cradle of civilization as being the place where everything happens first, but not so with, with uh, ceramics. Ceramics was practiced um, in China almost 10,000 years before it, it develops in um, the Near East. Of course, this is a very late stage in, in ceramics. There had been pieces around for 10,000 years already, but most of the decoration of these ceramic urns were um, geometric fig forms, right? So you get this wave-like structure on this particular one. Now, the idea of making patterns goes way back, right? So um, this is a piece of ochre that had been engraved some 75,000 years ago. And we can see that the person was very careful to create a pattern in it. This is, you know, this is really the, the one of the very first um, objects that we we see that there is a sense of an aesthetic for and they're making patterns geometric patterns um, and so uh, the idea of making geometric designs or patterns is really something that goes way back into the history of humanity right um, so um, it's not surprising that lots of pieces of um, ceramic, are decorated with with uh, patterns. The Jaman uh, uh, ceramic begin is a Japanese form that begins in the Paleolithic, right? So uh, somehow or other, back before there were uh, uh, settlements, people were um, you know having fires and putting, you know, maybe mud bricks around them. And eventually they found out that the mud bricks would harden. And uh, we had the beginning of ceramics, you know, and uh, then then there was control. The Joman uh, type of pottery actually has a almost like a 14,000 year history. And it has all these phases where it becomes more and more intricate. But this is some of the really um, ancient ones. And there was ceramic even before that. Um, uh, a couple of shards that come from ceramic pots. There was some ceramic use for sculpture even in Europe, but it wasn't used to create pottery. In the Near East, we don't see um, pots until, you know, uh, well into the Neolithic period. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, they divide the Neolithic into the in the Near East into the pre-pottery and the pottery periods, right? So uh, there's always some other way of dividing time up, and um, the first the first couple, uh, couple millennia of the Neolithic, the Near East did not have pottery, but when they did. 
you can see now the, um, the geometric designs in it. And uh, in this period, the Ubiad period, and we're looking at these geometric designs, there's the piece that I really wanted to close with, right? And then we'll, I'll be able to take some questions, right? So this piece over here, um, the bushel uh, with ibex motif, this figure, right, that's um, on this, this, well, sometimes they call it a beaker, sometimes they call it a bushel, sometimes they call it a vase, but um, it is essentially a, a container for storing grain. Right? And um, it's about uh, two feet tall. And uh, on, on it, we're looking at the, the you know, the, the striking image in the center of this, we see the circular form and inside it, you see the, the geometric design. But when you follow those circular forms around, it takes you to the bottom and you see a goat. Right, and this goat uh, is not a, a naturalistic goat like we're used to seeing in almost all of the uh, uh, prehistoric art. Right, this goat has been abstracted. Um, in order to um, create an image that was pleasing, you notice that um, the bottom half of the, the negative space under the goat is a semicircle, right? So um, the, the, there was a definite plan in altering the, the structure of this creature to fit an aesthetic need that is beyond representation. And we'll call that abstraction now, right? This figure is purposely abstracted in, um, in, in the purpose of uh, adornment in this case, right? Uh, and then if you notice, there's the repeating of the circular, the semicircle on the bottom with the the horns creating another circle. So you got this rhythm, rhythmic thing happen. Above the goat, there are two other tiers of animals. Now the dogs are are fairly representational, right? Um, and they they create a, 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 a ring, right? And you, and they they keep your eye moving around around this structure. And then above them, there are waiting birds, right? And these waiting birds are are simplified into just a few strokes, right? There's the long neck, there's the time when the brush went a little bit heavier to make the body and the beak above. Now, the idea of taking um, a natural form and abstracting it is, is very new. We've seen that you could make geometric patterns and it's been done for a long time. And we've seen that animals can be uh, reproduced often very realistically. But in this, there is a completely different sense. There's the sense of manipulating reality creating an abstract version or distorting reality for a purpose, right? And I think this is really, really an important um, mental construct because what comes shortly after this is the development of writing, which is again, that same idea of taking these markings and attributing a different purpose to them. And that's really what we have for today. Uh, when, I, uh, when I come back to this, I guess that's the one that was going to be in March. I'm going to talk about some of the earliest civilization and, and uh, we'll see how the, uh, the egalitarian society um, gives way to a hierarchical society then. But um, that's what I have for you. And um, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's see. I've Hi, lost. John. Hi. Okay, I can read you some questions that have come in. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just gonna go back to here because um, I lost the whole screen of people. I don't know how to get oh. it back. Okay, go ahead. Oh, you can just stop sharing, and everybody will come back to you. Yeah, you want to stop sharing? It's up to you. But if you do that, then everybody will come back. 
Okay, well, um, they might want to see a picture, but I could always go All back right, into it. Right? Okay, hi. Okay, let's see. So let me just go into our chat here. Um, our first question is from Stephanie, and she said, when were ceramics and pottery started? And then, um, were the stone structures intended to be works of art? Hold on, I'm just going through everything. That's a good question. Let me, don't go any further. Sure. That's two already. That one. That's two already. You're gonna. You can't ask me another. So, uh, so ceramics as pottery um, first begins oh about eighteen thousand years ago in China, right? And it doesn't reach the Near East for over ten millennia. But in in the Near East and Europe at that time, they were pretty much a similar culture. Um, they did have a ceramic sculpture, right? But they didn't create pottery. The second question was, were they works of art, right? That's uh, an interesting question, right? Because um, we tend to think of a work of art as being something that is created by an individual with, with an idea in mind. And under those definitions, the structures don't work as uh, works of art. We look at them as cultural transmitters, though. They give us a key into what their culture is. And um, we all find that there are different, def in different cultures, what is a work of art may vary as well, too. Um, some places, like our culture, has the cult of individuality. So we look as look at art as being something that's created by a unique individual. But in um, in other cultures, in tribal cultures, um, they oftentimes don't even uh, pay attention to who made a thing or or you know it's it's an expression of a culture as opposed to an expression of an individual. And um, it's a big debate, you know, what is art? So um, that'll be for another time. <laughs> um, we have another question from Isabella. What uh, were the stone structures intended? Oh, wait, sorry. I didn't mean that one. Uh, you just did that. Um, what did they use to move the stones? And Okay, so the... Um, and the idea of moving the stones, um, normally uh, uh, heavy stones like that would be moved on a series of logs. They would um, lay out a set of logs, knock over the stone on it, and push it slowly. All of them would roll. They'd take the ones from the back, put them in the front, and keep it rolling that way. That's even how the Egyptians uh, put the stones in place. What's more interesting is how did they get them to stand up? <laughs> you know, and, and in getting them to stand up, what they ended up doing was uh, building basically a ramp, and at the end of the ramp, putting a hole you know, deeper than the ground, right? So then they would actually push this 20 to 50 pound, ton rock up the ramp and push it right over the edge. And uh, as it went over the edge, it would flop down, right? And, and, and fall in the hole. And that's how they would stand up. Then, of course, they had to put the pieces on top. You know, again, so you have to build a whole ramp of dirt right? A whole ramp of earth and push it all the way up. All right. It's not an easy task. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you need to have a lot of cooperation. Now, the Egyptians, you know, we know they use slaves, but um, we don't have any sense of there being anything like that in the culture of the people of, of um, Stonehenge. If anybody else has any other questions, you can pop them into the chat box now. Um, we did get a question from Stephanie about this being archived, and just so everybody knows, these are always archived and available. Um, you can rewatch them on our Facebook, so if you just go to our Facebook page, at Patchwork Arts, click videos, they're under there, and then usually within about a week or two, they end up on our, um, our YouTube as well. Oh, right. And on our YouTube, that's kind of, that's Facebook. Unless anybody else has any other questions, I'm going to pop over to Facebook and check real quick. Okay. The nice thing about this is 
I don't have to wear a mask. You know what it's, you know how hard it is to talk for an hour with a mask on? Oh my gosh, very. <laughs> it's really hard. Wow. <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you. Thank no you, Stephanie. questions from Facebook. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, that was good. Uh, you know, um, Thank you, Professor as you know, what ends up happening with all of these is they begin as the germ of an idea. And then I just start looking into, you know, I start doing some research and, you know, every one of these, I, I learn, learn more uh, as I'm preparing. So I really enjoy doing them. I, I get so much out of it. All right. Thank you, Agnes. You have lots of thank yous coming in. Thank you, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, Getty. <laughs> You, it, it, you know, and I have to thank Isabella for actually having a face because um, I feel like I need, you know, when I talk to a screen that's all like black, it's it's kind of odd. You need to have some, some, there's Stephanie. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, it, it does help to have like the sense that there's a human on the other side of the, of what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> like I was saying before, uh, Garrison Keillor used to tell this story on the Prairie Home Companion of how he, when he was a college student, he worked at the college radio and he would go in for his show no matter how bad the weather was. And he did this whole thing right through the winter. And in the springtime, he found out that they had shut the transmitter <laughs> off six months earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not true, but it was a funny story. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, just so you know, you had a bunch of watchers also on Facebook, and everybody Oof. has thanked you very much for the talk tonight. Good. And do you want to just shout out to the Patrick Medford Library for co-hosting and offering these with us? It's because of their support, we can offer these programs for free. Yes. And you want to just remind everybody of the next dates, John? Okay, so the next thing up, go back to February, my calendar right here, I bought myself a calendar this year, um, on the 6th at 1pm, it's Coffee with the Curator, right, and of course, I'll be talking to uh, some of the artists in Generations of Color, it should be really interesting, um, and if you're one of the first 25 to register with the Pat Med Library, you will get a souvenir cup and a package of ground coffee, special Pat Med coffee, right? Uh, and uh, Pat Med PML coffee, right? The first 25 people. When we started the Coffee with Curator series, we actually did it in the gallery. That was pre-COVID and uh, the library supplied uh, coffee and treats for everybody. So we really love working with the library. Thank you. Uh, on, this, on the 18th of February, um, we'll be talking about the history of African-American art. And again, um, you know, you just start looking and you find out new things that no one ever told you before. <laughs> you know? And it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, in March, then, um, uh, the first thing that's going to happen is... Um, I have a I have a March eighth learning to look and a March twenty fifth learning to look. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. Did somebody double book me? I don't I know. No. Wait a minute. Uh oh. We'll, we'll have to <laughs> check on those. We'll have to check on those. I'm waiting on a question too, John. We may just give me one minute. We may have a question coming in from okay, okay, from our so, friend Bill Shalalies. From our friend Bill Shalalies. Yeah, he said he may have a question, so I'm just waiting for him to pop that up on Facebook for us. Oh, okay. So um, our next show will open on March 13th, and that's sidling. And if you don't know what the term sidling means, it is the motion, the form of locomotion of a crab. And that's all I'm going to tell you. You know, this is going to be one of those things you're going to have to figure out for yourself. Until, of course, everybody knows. But right now, uh, I'm only letting you know that sidling is the motion of a crab, and that's what gave the title to the next show. And then on the 20th, we'll be doing the Coffee with the Curator series with sidling. Then in April, <laughs> in April, okay, um, 
at the end of the month, we'll be having a pop up show. Um, uh, I but Chris, I don't have a last name here, so I'm forgetting that. She has a a, a grant to from who is that NIFA? Uh, yes, it's a NISCA decentralization NISCA grant. grant. And we're going to host her for the weekend, and she's going to display a series of portraits that she has made of um, beekeepers on Long Island. You know, so it's very important that we keep the bee population healthy. So these people are our front line in that. And then, then we'll be doing on on um, May first the coffee with the curator with with. Uh, the artist. And just to confirm, um, for March, our next learning to look is the 25th. Okay, so I can erase the March one for the 8th. Yeah, that's that Monday one we couldn't do. Um, I No other questions came in, so hey. I leave it to you, Mr. Sino. Well, I thank you all for being here. Um, you know, the 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 Neolithic uh, is it, it has a whole kind of straggly ending, de depending where you are. And I was already thinking, you know, uh, you know, there's so many other parts of the world that that I didn't get to talk about that I may come back to this again. But um, uh, I have a few interesting plans ahead, um, and uh, but I do want to do that. Uh, in two months, I want to follow this one up with the beginning of, of the, uh, the cities, states, the beginning of a hierarchical structure and how that, that appears in art. That's it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.